We are in the beautiful city of Kings and Queens going to Tuziatunga. And today we are having a beautiful feature where we honor influential women from the region of Matebeleland. My first guest for today is very, very amazing. Like she's a phenomenal woman and she's none other than Colonel Minio Tabo Baloi Chiwenga. Mama Linjani. Yeah, Pila. Linjani. Yeah, Pila. Yes. Welcome to Bulawayo. I know that you no longer live around here, but welcome. Thank you. And today we would like to get to know who Mini Yotabo is. We are looking at the work that you have done, and you have done phenomenal work. I follow you all the time, and we see the work that you are doing. And today we just thought we'd shine the light on the work that you have done, and also help people understand who Colonel Mini Yotabo Baloi Chiwenga is. Can you tell us about your upbringing? How was your upbringing? Well, good question. <laughs> well, like you said, um, Kenneth Minio Tabobalo Ichiwenga, born in Fulaposi, in Matabelin South. The first years of my life, I was at an area called Intunteni. That's where I did the first two years of my primary education. And then I went to Sababa Primary School that's where my father was teaching, and later on became a headmaster there. After that, I went to Excellent Mission, or Excellent Secondary School for my Form 1 to Form 4. And then I did Lower 6 and Upper 6, six at JZ Moyo High. Before I ended up joining the Army, I went to Zimbabwe Military Academy to train as, to train as an officer cadet. Okay, looking at your background, Ukulele Filabusi, how did this shape the woman that you have become? Because Sonke Life's Vele Corner has a very big contributory factor on where we go. How, how has this contributed to the woman that you are today? Well, it has shaped the person that I, I am in many ways and in ways that I'm proud of. Growing up at Flabus, we call it Ukolai Omnyama, Mashaba Itwale. We believe in Ubuntu. We believe in a community way of doing things, whereby a person is not raised by one person, they are raised by a community. So it was sharing food, sharing ideas, sharing values, and it's not about you alone. So it shaped me to be a person who believe in a community, a person who believe in an extended family, a person who believe that a visitor will never finish your food, if I could put it in simple ways. Because my grandmother, Veni Mangena, she would like take care of the whole community. I remember when I used to go to the village when I started working, I would bring her maybe a grocery with four loaves of bread and she would take that bread and literally give the community. No. <laughs> and she would remain with nothing and it would like pain me, like I want my grandmother to eat. So I ended up knowing that if you're going there, you, you bring a minimum, what we call a dozen, so a box of bread, so that if she gives the community, she and then she will remain herself, with yeah. something for herself. So that has shared me a lot. So I believe in taking care of the people around me, uh, the extended family that I have. So that's the person that I am. But also it taught me to be a street person. I'm very like, I'm not perfect, but I'm principled in, in a certain way, because I believe like you are what you present to people and respect is end. So that upbringing means everything to me. I wouldn't trade it for anything else. You mentioned that a person is raised by a village. Going back to Philip Busing is Katsanasiana, what would you say is the one lesson that you have taken through your life that you still hold on to from the upbringing, from the difference that was there when you were raised and the society that we now have now? Yeah, a lot of things have changed. Then there wasn't much exposure to the outside world. And as a woman, you were like expected to just grow up, not to go to school much and get married and 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 there. But there are also a lot of beautiful things that we can take from that upbringing. It comes with a lot of challenges, but a lot of uh, beautiful things also. So one thing that I describe what I, I get, I'll say it again and again, is Ubuntu. That's what I got from my community and I'm so proud of that. Thank you so much. So looking at the career path that you cho chose to take, what inspired that journey and that decision for you after completing your A-level to say, I'm going to join the military? What inspired that decision? 
I always joke with people and say I become a soldier by accident. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's not like I wouldn't come here and stand in front of you and say I planned it and you know, no, it didn't. So I remember I had just finished my A level and I was waiting for my results. Then when we're in that wait period, I had a friend of mine, her name was Notani Maposa, may her soul rest in peace. So we just picked this newspaper. It's like I use picked because we we're not people that would read newspapers. We could not afford to, to buy, buy newspapers. One. So we're just going through the newspapers to just see some pictures and while up time. And then we see this advert which says the military will be taking female cadets for the first time. And upon completion, they are going to be second lieutenants. So we took that. I went to my dad and said, Dad, what is a second lieutenant? And then I said, to him, I second lieutenant. <laughs> so I was like, OK, I want to be a big boss. So I want to I'm be going there. So me. when I went there, I thought like they would just come and give me an office and say, you're now a big boss and whatever age. Something else happened. I don't, <laughs> want even to, I don't want to talk about it in this uh, platform. but. Whatever happened, that accident, it was a good accident if there's anything like that. Because I ended up like starting to realize what the military entails and how strong you're expected to be. You're not expected to cry in front of people. You have to control your emotions and so on and so forth. I can go on, but that's how I ended up in the military by accident. So would you say that this accident was something that was a defining moment for the journey that your life has taken to up to where we are today? It was. It was a defining moment because when I got there and I did the training, like I said, we're the first female officer cadets to, to train there. There was this urge in me to say, I don't have to let down the woman next door. I have to, to prove to the world that women can go and do the military training and make it and be strong and become like commanders. So that's what pushed me. I said, whatever happens, I'm not going to fail. I'm not going to break down. I'm not going, I'll be a strong woman. So that accident shed me in that way because I had to promise me Mm -hmm. and to do it for everyone else. Because if we had failed as a group, everybody was going to say, you, you, you see, women, women can't, can't do, do this. This, this is what we've been yeah, saying. this is what we've been saying. Women can't do this. So I had to be strong for that purpose. So after embarking on this journey, like you were saying, it was into the unknown, where, what were the challenges that you faced? Because this was you embarking on a journey that you had never thought of, that happened by accident. Yes. What were some of the actual challenges that you faced? In the midst of all the challenges, I will pick uh, gender stereotyping. As I alluded to earlier on, the military was not for women. It was male dominated and it's because of the things that are expected to be done there. And it's a, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Like you have to be strong to be in the military. It's not a, king, a kid's game. But there we were saying, okay, we are coming to join you guys and we can offer things that you can do. Of course, we can never be the same. We have our own differences and, and you know, weaknesses, but there are some things that you can also perform as a woman. So I think that gender stereotyping, like where men would think like, okay, we've been doing this. And then you girls are coming to try to say to us, you can be commanders, command men, face with an enemy and the death is at the doorstep. How can you do that? So obviously they had to protect the brand, if I use that, the brand that was there when it comes to military. And you know the Zimbabwe military is well known for, for their um, standard, which is not compromised. So in the process of doing that, as a woman, sometimes you feel like, you know what, people are, doub are doubting what they are um, capable of doing. Sometimes you get frustrated, you feel like, you know, for me to prove I can do it, I have to do similar things, like maybe twice than a man can do, because I really have to prove that I can do this. So that was the major challenge that I, I, I faced. I always give an example, when I finished my training and I went to where I was supposed to, to, to work. On the first day when I was introduced, so we were standing, you know, the soldiers would just stand, we call it a parade. Mm -hmm. So my commander came and said, okay, I have a platoon commander, so I was posted as a platoon commander. 
I have a, your, plat, your new platoon commander and she's second lieutenant Baloy. You know those guys were on parade. On parade, you're not supposed to laugh. They, they just <laughs> like broke down and laughed like they were going to fall. Oh my God. So there I was, uh, I, don't, I didn't even know how to, to, to react to that. So I said in my mind, you know, these guys are saying like, you guys, what you are doing is a joke. So how do I survive? How do I prove to them that I'm not a joke? I'm really here to do it. So we have what we call a pre-lunch run. I said, okay, I'm a woman, but I, I really have to prove to them that I, I was trained like you guys and I can do some things. So I just said to my second in command, from today onwards for one month before we go for lunch, we have to run for, I think we used to do like five kilometers like in the afternoon on resort. So I made sure that when we are running, I'll be in front of them. I won't remain, I'm, I'm just there, I'm there. So from that, they started to respect me. They said, okay, okay. So maybe she didn't just get so given the rank. She, she, she really earned it. So I believe that whatever challenge you first, if you work hard, people may have whatever thoughts they have, but if you prove yourself that you are worth it, they'll start respecting you. Because the truth is something that you can hide. This is a challenge that a lot of women face in the yeah. world of business. Career-wise, everywhere, people do have these perceptions that are there in regards to gender, in regards to women not being able to do things. What would you say to the young woman who's listening to us in regards to the stereotypes, in regards to the people who will actually laugh in your face? How did you get over that? I'm trying to imagine a scenario where you are arriving to be in command and people actually laugh in your face. How did you handle that going forward? I think to the girls out there, I would say to them, you know, in life, nothing happens by accident. You have to plan. You have to make a decision what you want to become. And once you make a decision of what you want to become, you have to work towards earning it. I see a lot of girls like who want to get things easier. If you want to get th things easier, nobody will respect you. But if you are consistent, you are persistent, you manage your time and you work towards what you, what you want to achieve. I think eventually it, it works and everything falls in place. That's what I would say. There's nothing that can substitute hard work. Okay, you, uh, you mentioned earlier on that you grew up in your rural home and just a question here related to your job and the entrepreneurial journey that you have taken. Did this pose any challenges or any disadvantages? I know a lot of people who look and say, no, I'm from Kai, I'm from Kezi, I myself am from Plumtree, I'm the girl from Plumtree. How can I manage against people who grow up in town, people who grow up in Aping Aping? What would you say to those girls? You know, that, that question makes me really sad. Why? Because in our community, we always think that growing up in village, in villages or in rural areas is a disadvantage or something that people have to look down upon. So we approach the world very apologetic, saying like, you know, I grew up in Flabosi, so me na ninja ninja ninja. But with me, initially I was affected by that because psychologically it really works on you. People look at you like you are a lesser person like you can't do some things. But one thing for sure, intelligence or good character is not determined by whether you grew up in town or in villages. It's about the, the community and the family that you grew up in. And if I'm to compare the rural, rural and urban communities, I'm tempted to think that the rural areas, they produce a better character than the urban one, because urban, uh, communities is all about a family, not a community, and that is, has comes with a lot of uh, problems. Because if your neighbor in town see your child doing something else, or even being involved in drugs, they won't even like do anything. They just look and leave it. But in villages, you know what? You'll be beaten <laughs> by somebody who is not even your mother or your your father. So, yes, my early years of my upbringing might have limited me in certain ways, in that um, you don't get exposure to certain things. You don't get uh, certain resources. If I could say, maybe going to write libraries to research for your schoolwork, or even getting a test book. Because when we were going to school, maybe you can spend the whole year without even seeing a test book. If you're lucky, maybe your teacher will be having one. So that kind of 
uh, affects you in terms of the results that you can produce even at school and, and so on and so forth. But after all that has been said, you really have to stand up and say, if I manage to pass and we are now all in university, you can't be using that excuse that I grew up in, in rural areas, I can't perform well in university. Okay. Now you're having the same exposure, the same resources. So it's an excuse that sometimes people use to, to cover for, for their mistakes and their failures. So growing up in rural areas or in urban, in urban areas comes up with a lot of advantages and disadvantages that you have to take advantage of if there are advantages. And if there were weaknesses, you can cover up for them as you grow and perfect them and you become a fine person. So when you're an adult, that doesn't count where you grew up. doesn't count at all. A question that I always like to ask people is, what drives you? You are a successful businesswoman and you have embarked on an amazing entrepreneurial journey. What has driven you to get to delve into those waters? You said that you got into the military by accident. Yes. And was you getting into business intentional and what has driven you so far? Okay. So my journey, I don't even know what I am. Of course, definitely I'm a military officer, but I'm a business person. Um, at one point, I used to think I would be where you are sitting. I grew up thinking I'll be a journalist. Okay. Yeah, when I was in the village, I would do some rehearsals to my dad and say, you know, I'll be a news reader. And he would like, in Dava, Zifunda, Umini, Otabo, Baloyi. So the such I, I thought I'll be doing later on okay, in life, which, which never, which never uh, happened, you know. Yes. But now, when it comes to my journey, as, um, you can't separate it, really. Because being a military person, gives you the discipline that you want towards life. It gives you the determination to know that if you do something, it fails, you can't give up. You just have to keep on doing. So you don't have pride because you're not trained to have pride. Somebody can tell you anything, you just have to live up with that. So mixed that military background, then I found myself starting my businesses because I had a, an extended family to take care of. My dad died uh, when maybe my youngest brother was two. So I have a lot of siblings, some of them step that I had to take to school, almost like 10 of them. So there I was being a civil servant and I had almost a family of 10 that I was supposed to take off. So that's when I started going to Botswana, South Africa, buying things, selling so that I can take care of my, my, my extended family. And then that, Combined with going to China later on, I discovered certain opportunities that came with it because I ended up in China for my university. So that's when I started my business. Other than that, there was this age in me to help the community, especially in terms of education, being a daughter of, uh, of an educator. I found myself opening Chivaraite Primary School. Chivaraite Primary School is at a farm, our farm, with my husband. So we opened it for the children of our farm workers. Because my husband used to tell me that I, I dream of a day whereby I will see a professor coming from a farm. So we said, how do you get doctors and professor from, professors from a farm? Then we have to give them education. So we built the school specifically for them. But because we said this school will have the standards of a private school but in a farm, we ended up having the nearby suburbs and even some people from the city center from Marare saying, no, we want to come to your school. So that's how I started to extend the school to accommodate everyone. But it started as a a charity project which ended up being a business also in a way. So we still have that um, the farm children are not paying but the other children coming from outside the farm they pay. So roughly that's what I do in terms of business and my career. So how do you strike the balance between your business, your career, your family? How do you manage to juggle things? There's the extended family as well. How do you manage things? Yeah, there, is ne there can never be a perfect balance, but I always try to manage my time well. So firstly, I say I do time management. I make sure that I don't overwork myself. I allocate my time. Almost every day I have to be saying from this hour to this hour I'm doing that so that I don't, I don't get uh, overwhelmed. And also I do what I call uh, talent, talent sporting and empowerment. I have a way of 
identifying people that can, you know, compliment me. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, I go about saying, if it's this area, who can help me? And I always acknowledge my weaknesses. In areas where I'm, I'm weak, I always find someone who's strong to work with me so that it, it becomes easier. So I do delegation. Those things that I can't do, I delegate to people who can do them better. So I think that's what makes me remain sane. I, I just have other people to I think help I will me. definitely be adopting that one. <laughs> I'm yeah. taking quite a number of lessons yeah. from this conversation. And if there's one thing that intrigued me when I was following you and following your journey, it's the number of languages that you're fluent in. How did you manage to learn all those languages? Well, how many are there? I, 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 I don't want to leave it to speculation in my research. I want to hear it from the horse's mouth You know, today. social media lies a lot. Eh? <laughs> some they say I speak nine languages. Some they say I speak 15. I'm like, why did I even speak those 15 languages? I think I can say around five, six. I'm saying five, six because in the Bede and Zulu, they are almost the, okay. the same thing. Yeah. All right. So five, six-ish, those are the languages that I speak. Some of them because of where I grew up. You obviously speak those languages. When I went to work, you get to speak Shona because I went to work in my Shona land. And then English, obviously, is the official language for Zimbabwe. French, we, the military was deployed in Congo, so I got an interest there. I started learning it. Uh, Chinese, I got a scholarship, so it wasn't planned. I got a scholarship because of the look East policy. So I was the first person who qualified in the military to go there and learn Chinese. So that's when I ended up doing a degree in Chinese for four years. How did it feel being the only one being selected, the first, not the only, but the first to open that door, to open that channel, the girl from Filapusi, who some probably used to think, okay, how did that feel? It felt so good and scary. It's scary in the sense that everyone thinks Chinese is very difficult. So I was like, what if I fail? Mm -hmm. But only to discover that Chinese is very easy. It's just scary in terms of the writing, but it's easy. So I, I enjoyed the experience. And I'm very happy to say I opened the doors for, for all the other people that followed after. Because when I went, they had said, we're just going to do some certificate or basic Chinese. So when we finished that first year, one of the professors says to me, you have a very good command of languages. Why can't you just write to your country and ask them to allow you to, to, to go for four years? We can offer you that vacancy. So that's when they offered a vacancy to Zimbabwe, sponsored by the Chinese government. So when they started that, then they opened the doors for all the students to come after me. So oh. I, I'm, I'm so grateful that I managed to open that corridor for So them. looking at life, as we navigate life, one of the biggest fears that we have is what you just said. What if I fail? How do you constantly bring yourself from that place where you are faced with so many fears? Because I know that even probably from the audience, there's someone right now who is afraid to say, what if I try that and I fail? Yeah, that's our biggest, biggest weakness and my big, biggest weakness also. Uh, in a sense that I'm always tempted to try to be a perfectionist and it really works on you when you are trying to be perfect and it doesn't end up working that way. But now then I try to balance it and say, okay, I go into doing something and I try to be perfect as much as I can. If I fail, I give myself time to grieve, if I use that word, that, that time must be short. So you, you go back to yourself and look at where did I go wrong, what did I do wrong, and then you try to, to correct the things that you did wrong and wake up and move again. You, you, you can't say because I failed in doing something, then I can't do it anymore. Then you have stopped living. You really, you're going to fail. We are not in heaven, we are in earth. So failure will come. It will come, point. but what, what you makes you do? a better person is... How do you deal with that failure? So that's what I said. Allow yourself to be sad. Allow yourself, even if those that want to cry, allow yourself to cry. But after you've done that, just wake up and raise yourself and start doing again, doing it again. But make sure you learn from that mistake. You can't get, keep on doing the same mistake. The world can't forgive you for that. Okay, so looking at being married to the vice president, how has that impacted your life? Wow, another accident. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Now, you know, growing up, I never thought I could be married to a vice president, but things happen. So when that happens, me being somebody who grew up in Flabusi and being um, someone from very humble beginning, I'm not, I don't know, maybe I'll leave other people to, to judge me, but I'm not someone who is very flashy or who is very loud in your face like that. So I don't think I'm a, a celebrity kind of person. Mm -hmm. I'm just a, a bit on the toned down side. So getting married to him, the first disadvantage, I'll start with disadvantage, <laughs> that it gave me is I had too much attention that I didn't ask for. So everybody's trying to say, who is this? Who is and nobody knew me. They were like, who is she? And they are still trying, trying to know me. Some have the wrong things about me and whatever. So I would say it gave me too much spotlight that I was a bit uncomfortable with. But with that spotlight comes advantages also. Because now we are saying if we are people, we, are, we have things that we feel strongly about. And being the wife of a vice president, if you walk to an organization or a company and tell them of a cause that you want to fight for, they are likely going to, to support you. That comes natural. So I'm, I'm forever thankful for that because now I can voice and say th certain things and people can listen and try to assist the underprivileged as much as I can. So that's how I see myself using that position for, for the betterment of the next person out there in the world because at least... I have that influence to some extent for people to listen to me. So that's what I think is the advantage that came with that uh, spotlight. <laughs> I like that you highlighted the issue of causes. If you were to be given the power to just fund one cause, what would it be and why? It's difficult for me to choose one cause. Oh. <laughs> right, let's narrow it down to yeah. three. Okay, let me, let's say three, right. The first cause will be for something to help people with drug and substance abuse issues because I see that it's destroying our, family, our families, our communities a lot. It's something that I'm very passionate about and I can ensure you that in the next few months I'll be working seriously on those issues and trying to help. And then the second issue, it will be to do with the education of the less privileged because I see a lot of children with uh, the brains, but they don't have the chances. And then the last one will be to do with the um, green energy and water provision for rural areas. If I can be able to do those three, at least I'll be able to smile. Okay. Yeah. And what advice would you give to young women aspiring to be entrepreneurs, aspiring to take different journeys? Every journey is different. There's one series that I go by that says that the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Mm -hmm. And we need, to, we need to embrace our journeys, understanding that each and every journey is different. What would you say to that young woman who is just beginning her journey, mm -hmm. who is starting out in life and trying to find her feet? Uh, I would say they have to be disciplined. I always talk about discipline, personal discipline, because if you want people to take you serious, you have to to have that standing that people will take you seriously. And then I always speak passionately about financial discipline because if you're not disciplined, even if you get the money, you're going to spend it in a second. So discipline will be one thing that I will tell them that they have to do. And then the other thing is like, I'll tell them there's nothing like easy money. Mm. If you find yourself just in one second being able to make a million, eh? maybe you are lucky, <laughs> but I don't know if it's a sustainable business. Um, having a business is a process, so they have to trust the process. Mm -hmm. You have to start small, you grow until you get to, to where you want to go. Because if you go through all the stages, if you, even if you fall, it's unlikely that you fall from up to down. Maybe you fall to the next stage, mm -hmm. so at least it's better. And like just waking up, you, you are somewhere there, you don't even understand how did you get there and how to, 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 to deal with being there. So I would say to the girl there, work hard. Yeah. If I've, say, I've said it many times. Work hard, be disciplined, have the correct character, because if you are the CEO or whatever with a questionable character, it always works against your, your decision and the, the kind of networks that you are going to attract. And be kind to, to people that you meet. 
because you don't know what that person will say in your absence. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see someone, you say, ah, this one is just a useless person. But th those people will be able to speak for you when you're not there. So I always say, be kind to the, to the environment, to the people that you are with, and try to do your best in the way you can to help other people. They will help you one way or the other. So, so I think that's what I can say to them. If there's one take home that I always get from all the conversations that I have with people is that there are points in life where situations come and happen that totally take you off the route that you thought you were going on. Have there been moments where you have experienced situations that you felt you could never come back from? And how did you manage to get yourself back on track after the occurrences? Um, I've been very lucky in my life. I really, I think I have had a very happy upbringing. You know, we didn't have much, but at least I had so much love around me. Even when I was staying with my stepmom, my, my father used to make sure that he really protects me. So I don't really have specific ugly moments that I can say this really was the, the lowest of my, of my life. But one moment that I can remember is in 2012 when I had an accident. So um, my car rolled and the doctors said that they were going to put some metal thing on my knee and I was going to be disabled all my life. So there I was thinking like, I'm not old, so I'll, I'll be a cripple and I'll be working with whatever. I had so many dreams and I thought everything was coming to an end. But I thank God that didn't happen. Somehow, somehow I was miraculously healed and they ended up not doing, putting the things that they were supposed to put. So that was a moment that I really thought everything was coming to an end. But from that moment also, I got my strength to say, well, it, it improved my spirituality, like I said, there is God in heaven, because there are things that happened that I didn't understand how I survived. So that helped me to look at my spiritual life and say, you can have all you want, but sometimes you really have to go back to God and thank them and be grateful of the things that they have done for you. So that moment affected me, but also made me a stronger person. So I think that's the major one that I, I can mention. Allow me to continue to take you back to your past. Mm -hmm. Growing up, what is the fondest memory that you have of your childhood? What's the one thing that you think of and you know that this was the moment when I was happiest? Well, when I was, go I was staying with my granny, you know, I was so happy. I was like uh, someone, you know, being a kid full of energy, would go to primary school, we start doing these traditional trends, would do these dramas, you know, just so I always look at those experiences and, and smile about them, we'll go to church, you start singing, and so on and so forth. So I think my rural life really is something that I can look at and smile about it. We all have those people that we think of and say, all right, if I could have dinner with so-and-so, right now, if you could tell me maybe four people, mm -hmm. alive or dead, that mm -hmm. you could have dinner with or that you could interact with, who would you choose and why those particular people? Okay, so I would choose people that are dead because I believe that people that are alive, I will always have dinner with them. I'm that person who has that confidence. If that person is alive, I'll be able to One help time you now. So it's not something that I'm worried about. But those that are dead, because I, will, I feel like I can't have that chance, so I really think if only. The first person, like I said, from my conversation, you should have told that I'm very close to my grandmother. Mm -hmm. If I had my way, I would have dinner with my grandmother, Mbeni Mangena. Just spoil her, because she did a lot for me. And unfortunately, she died when I was not having any resources to spoil her. Mm. I wish she was here. My father, Fineth Valoi, she, he is one person who taught me the value of education. So my father was a teacher, but he made sure that I go to a boarding school, my fees are paid, and he really like preached to me about the importance of education. So he shaped the kind of person that I become, because I said, even if you're a girl, you have to go to school. And that way, the community will respect you. So he supported me in that. I wish he was there so that I can take him for dinner. And then there's my best friend, Notani Maposa. The reason why I wish she was here is because when my father was taking, taking me to school, he only afforded like school fees. He would not buy me grocery. He would not buy me anything. He would just pay my school fees and say, go to school. So Notani will always bring groceries for me. 
to make sure she brings shoe polish, soap, everything for me, whatever she ate, she will share with me. So I feel like if she was here, I was going to pay her back, but she's not there. So This is definitely getting yes. emotional. And then the last person is because of the work that she did. I think I would meet Mother Ter I would like to meet Mother Teresa mm -hmm. and see what she, uh, how she managed to impact the world by doing good deeds. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I wish I had met her, but she survived in a different environment yeah, and time frame from her. But what I can do is just to read about the things that she did and try to learn as much as I can for, from that. Yeah, that's very, like it's getting emotional. I can feel <laughs> myself tear up now no, just okay. at the thought because okay. we've all had those people that yes. have impacted us so much that we wish they could be there. But right now, as we come to the end of the session, if you could write a letter to Uminio Tabo Baloi, yes. mm. what would the letter say, dear Uminio Tabo? What would the letter say in a nutshell, probably in a sentence or two? What would you say to Uminio Tabo? Dear Uminio Tabo Baloi, please believe in yourself. That's it. And there we have it. It's been amazing as we have been joined by Colonel Minio Tabo Baloi Chiwenga as we are celebrating women from within the region of Matebeleland who have done the best. I'm sure you have heard it for yourself. We will be continuing with the feature, but this is the first feature for, for, the, for the session and look forward to many more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. <laughs>